We will talk about the project, the partners involved, and the tests that we've been doing with it, um, and what came out with, uh, of that. At the end of, the, of the, the presentation, there's some time for people to uh, try it out. Maybe not that much time, because we're on a tight schedule. Um, but we'll, we'll see how far we get there. First, the partners. Valence was a collaborative project. Uh, we're not, we didn't do this alone. And the idea is that a few partners were involved, some of them in the hardware, others in the software, and even others in just graphic design elements. And I would like to go over the partners uh, and their contribution to the project. Emerge, or EMRG, which is the Experimental Media Research Group. That's where we come from, me and Tom. Uh, so I'm Lief Menscher. This is Tom de Smet. And um, we are located in Antwerp, Belgium. And we are affiliated with the um, University of Antwerp and with the uh, art school, St. Lucas Art School um, of Art and Design. Uh, we develop uh, or we do research on um, graphic uh, modeling and um, modular interfaces, and also on text mining, which is uh, uh, just Tom do working on that. And the idea is that we produce or we uh, show our, our um, uh, research by uh, writing open source software for people who can use it then. Um, maybe the, the best known probably are Notebox and Pattern. It, Valence also was done in Notebox, which uh, it has a few versions. The version that we used was Notebox for OpenGL, uh, which is for this kind of uh, experiment the best tool in our arsenal. Of course, we could use other tools like processing or stuff like that. Um, <coughs> EMAC, sorry, we had EMAC. No, sorry, we didn't have EMAC. EMAC is the Inter-University Microelectronics Center, and it's a very big research uh, uh, group located in Leuven, also in Belgium. It has a, a few um, site research, research labs also here in the US and in Taiwan. And the idea is that they uh, do research on nano-electronics and nanotechnology. And they build, in fact, building blocks for, they do research on building blocks for the industry. And the industry being research in better healthcare, smart electronics, sustainable energy, and safer transport. The, res the research they've been doing on this project was in this headset, which is a wireless uh, EEG headset. And they concentrated or they focused on long time battery use uh, because they wanted patients to. Uh, be able to wear it a whole day, and uh, the wireless connection. But we'll get to that later. Then the host center is an independent open innovation art uh, research and development center, which is uh, located in the Netherlands, Eindhoven. It was um, started up by EMAC and TNO, which is something similar to, but then, uh, for EMAC, but then in uh, the Netherlands. And the idea is that they um, do partnerships with the industry and uh, with academia in, um, who has shared roadmaps and programs. And the idea is that they also build yeah, small components for the industry. And it's also in healthcare and um, uh, medical uh, advices. Holst Center was set up in 2005. And the name comes from Gilles Holst and who was the first director of the Philips uh, Research Center. I don't know if Philips is that known here, but in Europe, it's, uh, it is. Then Ludivin Lucha, who uh, we, worked a lot, we work a lot of times with Ludivin. She produces, or she's a generative artist, which produces uh, artwork for procedural design. The idea is that she uh, creates recombinable vector graphics, which we use in our software. And um, she, get, she gets his inspira or inspiration from nature, or she's at least inspired by nature. And the inspiration for Valence came from microscopic um, life. And so it, gives, it has this sort of feel to it. <coughs> this is a, a few of the components he made for something else, which uh, was a project by Tom and Ludivin. And it's a very big mural for the offices of EMEC. And it's called nano-physical. And the idea was to have a graphical inter interpretation of the research that EMAC is doing uh, 
in their team. Then the last one is Tim Augustin. Um, he's an electronics sound engineer, or he's an electronics and sound engineer. He works with Belgian rock bands, and he helped us out with um, attaching the whole system to uh, automation or a domestic automation module. He also uh, warned us not to go through customs with our first prototype, so he built this little case which is safe and uh, they let us through without any problem. Then wireless EEG, uh, electroencephalography or EEG. Uh, records the brain's spontaneous ionic action activity and the idea is that in for instance a patient who has epilepsy you can see abnormal activity and that can be observed by EEG analysis and everybody knows EEG probably from in uh, hospitals or uh, things <coughs> the uh, idea is that they or the researchers from EMAC and Holst made this um, developed this wi wireless low-power EEG headset and the, n the aim is to improve, to improve the patient's quality uh, uh, in life. They should be able to wear it uh, all day long and it could mean that they could be monitored from a distance because it works over a network protocol and, um, and they could be monitored while doing their just normal daily activities uh, without going to a doctor and so on. The prototype, which this one is not commercially available, it's really a prototype just to build, build for a few experiments, um, because again, they don't make finished products, they just build certain blocks which are inside this. And, but it could be, the whole principle could be replicated with a commercial device like Epoch Emotive, uh, which is a EEG uh, headset, which costs about $200, I think, uh, something like that. But the, the, the reading it gets is pretty much the same. The only thing here is that they focused on low battery uh, um, usage and uh, the wireless uh, connection. The EEG headset itself um, is designed like this. It has a wireless connection. It has also um, a microprocessor. And then it has a few eight in this kind, or sorry, six in this, uh, in this uh, example, dry electrodes. You have two different electrodes on EEG. You have the wet electrodes, which is a whole hassle because you have to do conductive gel on your head, even shave your head, then conductive gel, and then place on the EEG headset. This is pretty much uh, 10 times that easy because you can just put it on your head and the only uh, thing that, it, that we have to say about it is that it really hurts. It's a prototype designed for people to wear it all day, but they really can't find anybody to do this because it hurts so much. After like five minutes or 10 minutes, you feel the, the connections in your head and it's kind of sticky. Um, the, sorry, the brain waves that which we record, or the brain waves we can be recorded by EEG set, is uh, in the first time, or in the first place, alpha waves, which is an indication of relaxation. You can induce that by closing your eyes, and we started from that for our game also. The idea for the, the player is that he tries to relax to achieve the goal of the game. Other uh, brain waves are beta, theta and delta, which we don't read. It has the capacity to read this because it gets a raw signal. It should have to be filtered out, of course. We only do filtering of the, al the alpha waves. A second one we also do, and that's where the name comes from, is valence. And valence is a hip hypothesis which states that there's a, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere in your brain. And the right hem hemisphere should be responsible for negative emotions and the left hemisphere should be responsible or would be responsible for positive emotions. We tried to test it out or to see if our games could induce that, but that's really not the case. It's kind of very hard to know why they come up or, the, the, or why we have a valence reading. And there's not really... Um, um, something to pinpoint, I, yeah, I'm thinking about something negative, so I have feelings now or I have negative emotions now. It's very hard to do that. They're still doing research on that in uh, Holst Center. 
This uh, whole thing had to be done, or we had to make the project in a few weeks because we made it for the World Creativity Forum, which was held in Hasselt last year, and it has a few iterations. We started out with um, deciding what software we wanted to use, of course, and it's strange that it's just showing one, but that's, not, that's okay. Um, the game world itself is done in Notebox OpenGL, and um, which is uh, an open source software application that uh, runs or that can create visual, graphic visuals by, oh, uh, graphic visuals by uh, programming Python code. Uh, the game itself consists of graphical elements. Uh, it's something strange is going on. Yeah. Wait, I'll first, sorry. <laughs> I have to get my... Uh, battery. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Our game world uh, consists of particles um, which are uh, based on agent-based simulation. The best known agent-based simulation is described by Greg Reynolds, which is called Boyd's. And it's instead a simulation of uh, a flock of birds which don't run into each other and they uh, avoid each other by steering into uh, a similar direction. And the idea is that we have one main particle which attracts uh, the other particles. And the idea was to connect that to the alpha level. So if you relax, or in the game, if you relax, then you can attract the several particles to the main particle uh, in the center. And the radius will increase, or the, or the main particle radius will increase, the more particles that are attached to it. A second um, variation or a second uh, thing we did or second iteration um, uses pixel effects with uh, GLSL. GLSL is open GL shading language and it allows you to create pixel effects um, also at runtime from Python code. It's a subset of C program language and just to describe hardware accel accelerated pixel effects. Um, the final version has, or this version that you can see here now, has a ripple effect based on code by Adrian Boying. But we also implemented other pixel effects with, with, which are part of Notebox OpenGL, um, which is called Blur and uh, Bloom. Then, once we have that, far, or that, that basic principle done, then we can start importing the uh, elements or the graphic elements that Ludivine makes. And you see that it's a very rough uh, um, uh, thing now for the moment. And <coughs> then we go to a final, because I just have fine five minutes, I see. <coughs> so this is then the final uh, version of the game. Uh, you can see the main particle building up on the, the left side. And it has a few effects based on, uh, or a few GLSL shading effects. And what you can see here now is two sets of particles. There are the regular particles, which are the ones with the uh, yellow dot in, in the center. And then there's a few colorful uh, uh, particles, like the one with uh, the orange dot and the one with the, the little wings. And the idea was that to connect these ones to the valence. So if you are happy, or if you feel happy, then the feelies come around. Eh? And we call them feelies. Um, and the idea is that you get more color, because you're more happy than 
uh, the other thing. Now, we've seen feelies while testing it, but we couldn't say, uh, as I explained before, we couldn't say why, and the people which were testing also couldn't really say why that they, they uh, saw the feelies. Uh, last uh, implementation was the implementation of light, and you see here a few testings that were done it's at a, uh, also some kind of fair in uh, Belgium. And the idea was to attach it to uh, an automation module so we could uh, trigger lights or the intensity of the lights going up. Be Why did we do this? Well, in the first case, because they asked us to do this. And in the second case, the, the, the game itself is, for the player, really hard to understand because he doesn't see anything. You know, He has to close his eyes because he needs to stay relaxed, and the only thing he could hear was pop, pop, pop if the particles went to the, uh, to the main particle. But the idea is if you have an intensity of light going up, you can even see it when your eyes closed. And then you can see, when, wow, it's going, it's, it's working, and it, uh, that's what uh, uh, these things are. Now, oh. <laughs> The test that we've, de we've been doing, um, we've tested about 100, 150 people. The people that did it the best were small children, uh, because they, I don't know why, uh, because they, of course, they could relax better uh, in, in opposite to the discourse in Belgium and in the rest of Europe that kids really are uh, hypertension and have ADHD and ADD disorders, needs relative pills, but they really could relax very well. Um, other people which were able to do it in a convenient way said that it had to do with their courses in meditation or uh, relaxation, but of course that's something that we can't really uh, uh, Proof or uh, find out. About 20% of the people were unable to do it. Uh, of course, in the setting, it would be like a setting in here. People are looking at you, people are a bit agitated, and it's kind of hard to relax for a lot of people in a crowded room. But 80% of the people could manage it in, yeah, n sometimes not that long, even just two seconds or 10 seconds, uh, uh, between a, a period between two and 10 seconds. I don't know if there's still time. No, one minute, yeah, then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, we were thinking about testing it out, but that'll be for the next one. Okay, thank you.